Well, good night. <laughs> it is a good night, isn't it? Compared to one week ago, can you believe looking outside uh, that it was one week ago that it was snowing like a blizzard here? Um, I was just telling Pastor Jay that uh, this week I had a meeting with somebody from Ohio, and um, she told me that at their place last week, they got eight inches of snow while we got like three. So um, you might have thought it was rough, but it, we, we were really actually blessed. So, well, tonight we have um, another quiz just to try to make sure that you remember a couple of things. It's been, I think, what have you had, three days off now or something? And um, or, so we want to just try to refresh your memory. So the first question is a true or false. The second coming of Christ will be on the down low. I think you know what I mean by that, right? The hush hush, quiet. Hmm? All right, true or false. Uh, number two, Revelation 19.21 says, The rest were killed at his coming. The first chapter of Second Thessalonians helps us to identify those people. Uh, the description it uses there is that they don't blank God and don't blank the gospel of Jesus. Um, so if you can jot those on your quiz card there. Our third question tonight is uh, based on Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 to 6. We see the resurrection of the blank who will blank with God. And this, this is according to... It's mostly in verse 6 there. It's where you'd find that answer. All right. And the fourth question for tonight, Revelation 20 shows blank being bound for 1,000 years. Blank, Jesus' second coming. That's kind of a timing. That, that last blank is kind of a timing question. All right. Ready to see how you scored here? The first question I marked, false. You too? Good. It's actually going to be a very noisy event, right? All right, Revelation 19.21 says, The rest were killed at his coming, and then we identified them as those who don't know God and don't obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Uh, Revelation 24-6 says, We see the resurrection of the righteous, who will reign with God. Okay, I think that's the last phrase, that reign with God is the last phrase in verse 6. And then Revelation 20 shows Satan being bound for 1,000 years before, after Jesus' coming. Which was is it? After, following Jesus' coming. Okay. All right, well, did you score well? Andy, you didn't even get here in time to score at all, did you? All right. We can do it again. Yeah, all right. Okay. Well, let's bow our heads for a prayer, and we'll get started with the lecture for tonight. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for uh, such a beautiful spring day that you've granted us. Lord, we're um, feeling um, much brighter today and... Uh, just more cheerful on the inside, I think, because sunshine is such a blessing to us, and we thank you for it. We ask that you will please um, guide and direct in tonight's meeting. This topic is um, often very misunderstood and confusing, and, and uh, there's a lot said about you and your character in this topic, and we just ask that you will guide and direct in our teaching, in our hearing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Larry. That was a great quiz again tonight, and I always enjoy it. I mean, he, he uh, put some stuff into that, and to think about it, that's good. Well, I'm glad all of you are here tonight. We're going to get into this subject, and uh, our subject tonight is uh, hell, 
the real clear truth about a very serious topic. And uh, under that I have a quote from Scripture, Our God is a Consuming Fire. It was Voltaire. Voltaire was one of the foremost atheists in the late 1700s. It was his works that led to the French Revolution. How many of you remember the French Revolution in high school? It was a terrible time. Uh, I won't get a lot into it, except that atheism became the, uh, what should I say, the kind of the religion of the state. And what a lot of people don't know, I'll get into this a little bit more down the road, what a lot of people do not know is that Lenin, have you ever heard of Lenin who started the communist movement in uh, Russia? He got his inspiration from the French Revolution, which got its inspiration from Voltaire. Voltaire was uh, sitting on his, in his, beside his father or with his father one day, and his father was talking to him about the subject. And he told little Voltaire, and I don't know how old he was, eight, ten years old, he said, yeah, if you, don't, if you don't be good, then God is going to burn you and burn you and burn you and burn you and burn you forever and forever and forever. And they had a little conversation about that whole subject. And Voltaire, at an early age, looked at his father and said, I hate God. And he grew up to be one of the um, most well-known atheists in modern history. Voltaire over this subject. Um, well, let's see what the Bible says. As Brother Larry said tonight, sometimes this can be a little confusing. You will see that as we get into it tonight. But the principle that we always want to work with is to compare Scripture with what? Scripture. And the Scripture becomes its own interpreter. And, uh, and you always measure the obscure in the light of the clear. That makes sense? Good, good rules. Okay, here we go. We'll, we'll look at this. Matthew 16, 27. Before, I'm going to give you just a quick little review here of where we were. We talked the first night about what happens to a person when they die, and then we talked about the 1,000 years. Uh, before Jesus comes, the righteous are judged and the reward is decided. Notice this text. A lot of people don't know this. A lot of people think that when Jesus comes, the reward isn't there. But Jesus says, Matthew 16, 27, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of His Father with His angels, and then He shall reward every man according to His what? So there's a judgment that goes on before Jesus comes. We'll talk a little bit more about that another night. When Jesus comes, what four states will the human family be in? Just reviewing quickly, you have the righteous living. He that is uh, holy, let him be what? Holy still. You have the righteous dead who are asleep in the grave. They're not in heaven or in hell or in purgatory. We talked about that after the meeting last night. We, uh, the other night we talked about purgatory around the table there. But not any place like that. And then the wicked are also living because they cry for the rocks and mountains to fall on them. Hide them from the face of and then the wicked dead, of course, are already dead. So those are the four states of the human race when Jesus comes. And at the coming of Jesus, the righteous dead will be resurrected. That's wonderful news. And they'll join the righteous living. So now all the righteous are alive. Isn't that good news? Then the righteous will be taken to heaven for a thousand years. The wicked living are going to join the other wicked dead. And they're slain by the brightness of His coming and they join the wicked dead. Now all the wicked are dead. All the righteous are alive. All the wicked are dead. And they will be dead on the earth. We talked all about that. This begins the 1,000 years for which Satan is locked up on planet earth, bound here with no one to deceive. It's going to be a miserable time for the enemy of souls. During the 1,000 years, the righteous are in heaven and they become the jury and judging the punishment of the wicked. They're also going to discover why God made the decisions that He made. Every question will be answered. Our God is a God of transparency. Aren't you glad for that? He has nothing to hide. And every 
question things. There are plenty of things I don't understand. There are plenty of things I cannot explain. There are tragedies and heartaches and difficulties, and you can't explain them. But when we get to the kingdom of heaven, the God of heaven, if we trust him, we're going to have everything laid out, and we're going to be able to see why the God we serve is a God of love. Isn't that good news? He's a God of love. There's no one like him, and we don't want to serve anyone else. The earth then, of course, during this 1,000 years is left desolate, uninhabited by humans until the 1,000 years are finished. Then it says at the end of the 1,000 years, the wicked are resurrected to face their judgment. The rest of the dead live not again until the 1,000 years were finished. So this becomes a very fascinating scene here. And let's look at the uh, Revelation 20 verse 9, if you're following along, we're going to spend some time in chapter 20 here. And they, this is the wicked, went up on the breath of the earth and could pass the camp of the saints about and the what? Beloved city. Now, we haven't, in the book of Revelation, we haven't been introduced yet to the beloved city, but now we're introduced to the beloved city at the same time that we're being introduced to the resurrection of the wicked. Now, think about this. So all these wicked people are resurrected. Satan sees his opportunity to what again? Deceive. That was the key word. What is he deceiving them that they can do? What are they engaged in doing here? All right. They're, they're encompassing this beautiful city, and they want it for themselves, and they are deceived, believing that they can take that city. And... Um, so they're marshaled there around that city. Where did the city come from? I thought the city was in heaven. Well, listen to the Apostle John just a few verses later in chapter 21. He says, Now I saw a what kind of heaven and a what kind of earth? For the first heaven and the first earth have passed away and there was no more sea. So he's talking about the recreation of this uh, uh, world. Then I, John, saw the what kind of city? The holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So the earth is going to be recreated after this final attack by Satan. And the new Jerusalem is going to be its capital forever. I plan to have a home in the new Jerusalem. Don't you want a home in the new Jerusalem? And uh, it'll be a wonderful thing. By the way, the Bible describes that. I don't have time to get into that tonight. But if I remember correctly, it's about 1,500 miles on each side. How far is, where's 1,500 miles? Well, you could get to the southern tip of Florida and still have room to go. Still have room to go from Michigan. So you're talking about a place that's going to be plenty of room for everybody. We don't have, you don't have to worry about uh, that kind of a thing. All right, so John sees that city coming down from God out of heaven and uh, then it says they, they're going to attack the city. And when they attack the city, it says, and fire came down from whom? Out of heaven. And what's the word? What do you do when you devour a sandwich? Do you still have it? It's gone. Now, there's a tradition in our house because my wife's half Italian and she makes wonderful pasta. So she does that every Friday night. She just does it and I'm happy about it. But I, I had it tonight, and I devoured it. It's gone, I promise you. Uh, enjoyed every bit of it. Uh, this, of course, is not an enjoyable thing. What is actually happening here is that God, there's another text in Scripture that says every knee will bow. Uh, the whole universe, even the wicked, even the devil and his evil angels will declare that God is just. God is going to be vindicated in all of this. He's been accused of everything in the book. Satan has accused him of everything in the book. And when this happens, just before it happens, Lucifer, Satan, the devil, is going to acknowledge that just and true are thy ways, thou king of saints. Fire comes down from God out of heaven. This isn't because God takes any delight in this, by the way. The Bible calls it, in one place, God's strange act. And one reason I think that God, that, that God delays, we feel like sometimes God is delaying, delaying the coming of the Lord and the end of time. But God, I think, dreads this day. This is not a day God looks forward to. 
But the universe must be cleansed. If God wants to take the evil out of our hearts, isn't that right? Let's take the evil out of our hearts. The way he does that is by the power of the Lord Jesus. It's by being born again. It's by becoming a new creature in Christ. We become a new creature in Christ, and, God, and Christ forgives our sins. We become a new creature. That's how he gets the sin out of us. But if that sin is not taken care of by our heavenly high priest, if we don't confess our sins in repentance, then those sins remain with us, and then we become identified with the sin. So the only way God then can get rid of the sin is to get rid of the sinner. What God is trying to do now is separate the sin from the sinner. I say, I want Lord Jesus to do that work in me. Do that work in me. Don't leave me out on this one. I, I, want, that, I want the precious Savior in my life will be separated from that sin. Now the reason sin is so bad, I've explained that before, is because sin is a transgression of God's Ten Commandments, of His law. And if God's Ten Commandments are transgressed, life can't exist. So what God, Jesus is doing is by His precious power, He's bringing all of the human race that wishes, that trust Him, He's bringing them back into harmony with the law of life. And that we'll be in harmony with that the rest of our existence. Isn't that wonderful? It's wonderful news. And harmony is a good thing, isn't it? I was talking to somebody today and they told me they played the piano and then they told me, he says, my wife plays better than I do. I'm glad they didn't ask me. My mother, my dear sweet mother, she really wanted one of us to play the piano. And for, for three long years, she sent us to a music teacher to play the piano. And uh, uh, mother really wanted that to happen. I remember them getting that piano and putting it in the front room. And I, I, pa I practiced faithfully because my mother was going to see to it that I did that. That was just going to happen. But uh, my heart wasn't too much in it because Pastor Bob, I had my ball glove right there, and my <laughs> you got the picture. And uh, so the music teacher and my mother finally had a talk, you know. And some people have it, and some people don't. And I didn't. And I love music. But harmony, so you don't want me playing the piano. But you have a beautiful piano here, and I don't know who all your pianists are off the top of my head. But when the pianist gets a hold of that, and you hear the harmony, isn't it wonderful? That's what the universe is going to be. That's what God's Ten Commandments is about. It's about to bring harmony and sweetness into uh, human existence. So this fire comes down from God out of heaven, not because God enjoys that, but because God's got a task to do. He's responsible to the universe and to the rest of us. Here's the real truth about hell. For our God is a consuming fire. What does it mean to have a consuming fire? If you have a consuming, I rode by here the other night. They're, they've got some kind of development going on. As I rode home, they had a huge pile of logs, and they were burning those logs. And in the nighttime, you could see all the glow from this fire. When I came back the next day, that there was no more anything there. It had burned out. It was a consuming fire. It had destroyed everything. Our God is a consuming fire. Uh, the dictionary means to destroy something with fire, to do away with it completely. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. There's that lake of fire again. And brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. Now some people say that lake of fire is hellfire and it's down somewhere in the center of the earth. And the devil is in charge of it. Have you ever heard that before? The devil will get you and poke you in hell and they picture him as being... But who would put the devil in charge of justice? Who would put Hitler in charge of justice? And uh, Hitler is horrible, as horrible as that was, is a faint replica of what the devil and his, all of his mechanisms. Who would want him to be in charge? No, the devil is not going to be in charge of justice. He's going to be subject to justice. God is in charge of the final punishment. And so cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be... Now this is the one that really gets people interested. And they say, well, this says forever and ever. It's got to mean that they're going to be tormented and tortured forever and ever. Well, hang on because we just... Sounds like we've had contradiction here. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation 20 verse 10. So is the Bible contradicting itself? Well, let's just see here a little bit. Revelation 20, 11 to 12, Then I saw a great white throne, 
This is the final judgment for the wicked and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, this is the wicked dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were open. What kind of books are those? I'm telling you, God has a record of all of our lives. And another book was open, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which are written in the what? In the books. Every deed, every motivation is there. Verses 13 to 15, chapter 20, the sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades, this is the resurrection of the wicked. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the what? Lake of fire. This is the second what? You can't have it both ways. You can't die and then live forever in torment. Living forever in torment is not the same thing as death. When your battery dies, what happens? You're dead, right? It doesn't work anymore. It's gone. So you can't have it both ways. So what, this sounds like maybe there's some contradiction. I don't, there's no contradiction, but we'll see that when we go on here. This is the second death, and anyone found not written in the book of life. Do you want your name written in the book of life? Amen. When you give your life to Christ, and you, you baptized, and Jesus has transformed your heart, then your life, name's written in the book of life. What you don't want to do, though, is deny the Savior. and keep. I'll talk about that tomorrow morning. Pause right now. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to talk about... The first one is I'm going to talk about Daniel chapter 1 and how to live a happy, healthy life. You're going to love this in the morning. It's a change from what we've been doing. And then I'm going to talk about the unpardonable sin. And I'm going to go again to the book of Revelation. And I'm hoping to have a, a small video clip in the morning about the flood that will just be amazing. You'll, you'll love it. If we can work it out. We're working on it um, and uh, Kevin and I are going to work on it tonight. I think that you'll really love it in the morning. So anyway, we're going to get into that in the morning. But let's, uh, But the book of life, you don't want your name ever scratched out of the book of life. You want that there. And now look at what this fire destroys. First of all, it destroys the wicked and their what? In order to get rid of sin, you have to get rid of the sinner. So the wicked works are gone. Now the devil and his evil angels and their works. I'll say hallelujah. Cleanse the universe of these folk. These, folk, these people are, are, are beings are incurable. They cannot be cured. They are, they're forever have made themselves into a devil. You would think that the devil at the end of time, he sees that beautiful city. He sees the, the righteous have all been resurrected. We're all in that beautiful city. And you would think that he would just give up, wouldn't you? But he doesn't. That's what sin is like. It's stubborn. And I don't want that kind of stubbornness in my heart. And he gets rid of death in the grave. Isn't it going to be wonderful never to worry about having to die? Never to see death and decay. Our world is filled with death and decay. But this is going to be a world with no death and no decay. It's hard for us to even, Pastor Bob, imagine a world like that. Okay, let's look at the data here. At the beginning of the 1,000 years, the living wicked are slain with the brightness of his coming. To the beast, the false prophet, religious leadership are judged, thrown into the lake of fire. Number three, by the way, the lake of fire is right here on the earth. And that's a huge point. You're going to see that in a moment. And the righteous then are taken to heaven for a work of judging. Talked about that. During the 1,000 years, Satan bound for here. At the end of the thousand years, the wicked are resurrected. The books are open to the resurrected wicked. They are judged from what's written there. You know, what happens is the devil runs out of steam. He says, let's go take the city. And, but there's no support. All of his support's gone. It's finished. They know. They're thrown into the lake of fire along with the devil and his demons. Death and grave are also thrown in the lake of fire. Now, this is what I talked about the other night. This is the fearful second death. From the second death, there is no recovery. The first death is a what? Sleep. And what do you do from a sleep? You wake up. 
But the second death, there's no recovery. Hard drive and everything is gone. Notice the very next text. And I saw a new heaven and, oh, whoa, I want to stop right there. Now, it's just told us that they're going to be tormented in this lake of fire for how long, David? You know, for forever and ever. That's what the text says. Yeah, at the end of the thousand years. So you're, you're getting close. But now, the very next text says that I saw a new heaven and a new what? So you can't have it both ways. You can't have a lake of fire on the earth tormenting people forever and ever and ever and ever and then to have it disappear and go away and that then there's be a new heaven and a new earth. You understand what I'm saying? And there's no chapters or verses here, so that's all running together. So if you just keep reading right from verse uh, from the last part of chapter 20 right into chapter 21, it tells you here's the lake of fire on the earth. The devil and his evil angels and the wicked are all thrown into it. And then it uses that word forever and ever. And then the next thing it says that the first heaven and the first earth, is that our earth? Yes or no? Is past what? In other words, it's gone. It's finished. It's over with. So the wicked are not, can't be in hell burning forever and ever because there's a new heavens and a new earth. So what happened over there? Why does God use that kind of language? It's a fair question to ask. All right, let's, uh, so I saw a new heaven and a new earth where the first heaven and the first earth where the lake of fire was at had passed away and there was no more what? Sea. All right, this is, is this a contradiction or a paradox in Scripture? Well, let's take, look at the difference between a lake, uh, uh, a paradox and a contra contradiction. A, a contradiction means that you, you have something that really contradicts, that it's, it's opposite. A paradox has the appearance of contradiction, but when you look at it in its big context, it becomes, um, what's the word I want? It, it becomes um, a companion. It, you understand it. It's not contradicting, but it just gives you the bigger picture. So what we really have here, I believe, is a paradox, not a contradiction. Okay, let's go to uh, number one. Hell, the lake of fire, takes place on this earth. Two, the wicked are devoured. Three, yet it says they're tormented forever and ever. Four, this is God's just and righteous judgment. Just and righteous. Uh, can a just and righteous God burn a human being for, 50, for 100 years, even if they live to be 100 years, even 1,000 years? Can God burn them forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? And you've been through a billion years of burning and you're not even started. Is there any justice to that? So the Bible declares that God is just. Death and grave are destroyed. This is called the second death. The heavens and the earth pass away and are replaced with a new earth. A contradiction is to assert the contrary of or to deny the truth of. A paradox is a statement that seems contrary to common sense and yet perhaps is true. All the evidence points to the fact that people are not burned forever and ever. Yet there is a forever or eternal element to hell fire. You always measure the obscure in light of the clear. Let's think, let the Bible explain itself. All right, this is Matthew 25. Jesus talks about this. And these will go away into everlasting punishment. Look at that word. Come back to that moment. But the righteous into what? Look at this word. Pun everlasting punishment is not everlasting punishing. There is a difference. In other words... This eternal punishment or everlasting punishment lasts for how long? It's the dreaded second death because there's no return. It's eternal in its effects. So when the justice of God puts the wicked to death at the end of time, that death sentence is eternal. They're not coming back. No second chance. That's why this is a serious topic. 
The only chance you and I have is here. Now, today, So it's everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal what? Life. It is the punishment that is everlasting, not the punishing. Those are the words of Jesus. Now here are some other uses of the word forever. Does context make a difference, yes or no? Okay. Context makes a difference. Exodus 21 verse 5. But if the servant plainly says, I love my master and my wife and my children, I will not go free in the Israelite society. If you got in debt, you could work your way out of it in seven years. You could become an indentured servant, for lack of a better. But they had to let you go at the end of seven years. The debt was paid. But let's just say that uh, I decided that I, I, I got in debt and got in a lot of financial trouble. And so I had to owe this person a lot of money. But we became really good friends I really appreciated him. I didn't trust my own, my own uh, business acumen. And I thought, you know what? I, I'd be one smart man if I would just stay with this guy for the rest of my life. Uh, I mean, he knows what he's doing. And so I say to him, look, I, I think I'd like to stay the rest of my life here. And he says, you really want to do that? Yes, I really do. That's my choice. So he says, okay, that'll be forever. Well, how long does a person live? They die. So forever has a context, and the context is the rest of my life is, in essence, forever. And so that's what's happening there. And uh, they bring him to the doorpost, and it shall serve him forever. Can the story of Sodom and Gomorrah help us? I believe it can, with this, understand this paradox. They were burned with fire and brimstone from where? Now, what does the Bible say? What kind of lake of fire is it? It's a fire, a lake of what? Fire and brimstone. Now, let's listen to the scripture. The angels came and took Lot and his family and said, Escape for your life, lest you be, what's the word? Okay, and you're going to watch this very interesting. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from who? Now, in the book of Revelation, where did, what did the book of Revelation say? Where did the book of Revelation say the fire came from? From God out of? This is the same kind of picture. From the Lord out of? Same fire. Jude 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, giving themselves over to fornication, I won't get into that tonight, going after strange flesh, you can add and subtract are set forth as an example, suffering the what of what kind of fire? Now, question and answer. Is Sodom and Gomorrah burning today? No. I had a few years ago the privilege of going to um, Israel, and I stood at on top of Masada. I think that's the way you say it. It was the last stand of the Jewish people against the Romans. And I guess there's been a film made about it and all that kind of stuff. But at any rate, they ended up, several hundred of them committed suicide there rather than let themselves fall in the hands of the Romans. And I remember going out to the edge of that Masada, big cliff up there, and standing out and looking over that valley. And what I did not realize at that point was that I was looking at what I believe today was Sodom and Gomorrah. I wish I had time to put it up here, but there's been a, a, a lot of people that have gone there, and you can see the ruins of a city that's been turned to ashes, and it's filled with little tiny pieces of sulfur that one time turned it into Sodom, uh, into uh, ashes. So Sodom and Gomorrah has been burned with eternal fire. But is Sodom and Gomorrah burning today? No. It has an eternal aspect to it. Because Sodom and Gomorrah are not coming back. They're never coming back. Turning them into what? And that's exactly what you find there. And condemn them to destruction. Making them what kind of a deal here? 
example to those who would afterward live an ungodly life. So if you want to know what's going to happen to the wicked, the Bible says in the New Testament, take a look at Sodom and Gomorrah. They were punished with eternal fire, with destruction. That's what's going to happen to people who live ungodly. This is the eternal fire, or is this eternal fire burning today? And of course, the answer to that is no. How does Peter warn the ungodly? Let's listen to the apostle Peter. 2 Peter 3.10, the elements, talking about the earth, will melt with what kind of heat? Both the earth and the works that are therein will be what? The book of Revelation says the first heavens and the first earth were what? Passed away. So Peter is agreeing with that and he's telling us how it's going to happen. They're going to be burned up. Therefore, he goes on, since all these things will be dissolved... What manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Now, let's go and talk about uh, Jesus' own teachings, and I believe they'll agree with the Old Testament and the prophets. Listen to his explanation of what happens at the end of the world. This is Jesus, Matthew 13, 38. The field is the world, the good seed of the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is whom? The harvest is the when? In the world, and the reapers are the? You can read Revelation chapter 14, and it talks about the angels reaping when Jesus comes. So verse 40, as therefore the tares are gathered and what? In a fire. So shall it be in the end of this world. When you gather tares and you burn them, are you burn the weeds? Do the weeds keep burning? No. The concept is the weeds do what? They burn up. You get rid of them. I mean, what, what kind of... Uh, I, I know somebody can say, what about that story of rich man and Lazarus? There's a wonderful explanation in your packet tonight. I'm not going to go into it tonight. Jesus was using a parable. It's hyperbole. hyperbole. You know what that means? It means you exaggerate something to make a point. And it's... Um, and it, 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 a parables have, they make one point. I, I mean, for instance, Lazarus isn't going to be living in the bosom. If that's a literal thing, he's not going to be living right in the bosom of Abraham, is he? Calls my shirt to be unbuttoned, trying to illustrate that. But uh, no, he's not going to be in the bosom of Abraham. The whole thing, of course, is uh, that kind of a picture. Um, what would heaven be like if you knew your loved ones were burning and you'd been in heaven a, a billion years, a billion years of happiness, and your loved one's still burning in hell. What kind of, that's, that's madness, that's craziness. Um, that, that's not, that wouldn't contribute to our happiness. At the, no, God, Jesus is very clear. They're going to be gathered, they're going to be burned in a fire, and so shall it be in the end of the world. The, what kind of the world? The what of the world? The end of the world. And, what is the, and where is the lake of fire? It's in the world. We'll be in the end at the world. All right, let's go on. The Lord is long-suffering towards us, Peter goes on, not willing that any should perish, but all should what? Yeah, amen. That's the whole real issue here. Mark 9, 43. If your hands offend you, cut it off, Jesus says. It's better to enter into life maim than to have two hands and go to hell into fire that shall never Be quenched. I can hear somebody say, oh, okay, there it is. Jesus corrected himself. No, he didn't correct himself. Um, By the way, he's not suggesting that you cut off your hand, but he is saying is you better get yourself under control because it'd be better to deny yourself something that you want to do, that you like to do, deny yourself rather than end up being destroyed in the fires of destruction. It's better to have self-control than to die eternally. So here it says the fire that shall never be quenched. Have you ever seen a fire that couldn't be quenched? I think I've seen one or two. Uh, we had a neighbor's house one time, the neighborhood I grew up. We woke up in the middle of the night, and the neighbor's house was on fire. And it was unquenchable. It burned the place up. They couldn't put it out till it was finished, eating up whatever it, it did. The Bible also uses this. This is Jeremiah uses the same kind of terminology. If you will not hearken to me and hallow the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire and the gates 
talking of Jerusalem, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be what? So is Jerusalem still burning today? No, Jerusalem's not burning today, but it was destroyed. It was finished. And uh, so not be quenched means it burns until it burns itself out. Malachi, nobody, by the way, nobody's going to put hell fire out. Am I right? It's an unquenchable fire. Have you ever had crazy dreams when you were kids? Anybody have crazy dreams? Don't raise your hands. One of the dreams that, some of the dreams I like to have, I don't know if I like to have them, but I have them. And they say they're usually pretty healthy dreams, so I'll tell you that ahead of time. But that's to fly. If you like to fly in your dreams, you, those are usually pretty healthy. But I, I had uh, some dreams when I was flying, and I thought, and somehow, I don't know how hell got involved in this, but I got into an airplane to fly out. But it's not going to help you. So you can get in a 747. The atmosphere, everything's going to burn up. Everything in this world's going to burn up. You won't be able to fly your way out of it. That's what I'm saying. It's unquenchable. Nobody's going to put it out until it finishes its job, until it finishes its work. Okay, Malachi 4.11 pictures the same thing. The day that cometh shall burn them how? Up, says the Lord of hosts, and it shall leave them neither what? Now, what does that suggest? It means an utter destruction, a complete destruction. And you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be what under the soles of your feet? In other words, they, they are totally and completely uh, done. Here's, here's, I'm going to share a bunch of texts real quick just to show you the tenor, tenor of Scripture. The wicked shall perish into smoke. They shall what? Consume away. Obadiah 16, they shall be as though they had what? You can't be tormenting in hell and have that, as it were. For the wages of sin is what? Not eternal life in hell. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not, what's the word? But have everlasting life. In other words, the wicked perish but the righteous live forever. Ezekiel 18.32, For I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Sovereign Lord. Um, and Isaiah 28.21, For the Lord shall rise and bring to pass his what? This is not God's normal thing. He doesn't like doing it, but he has to do it. Hey, let me ask you a question. Do you think a judge enjoys sentencing somebody to prison? You think the judge says, oh, this is just wonderful. I'm just really enjoying sending people to prison. I don't think the judge enjoys that. I think he does it in order to protect society. The reason God destroys the wicked is to protect the universe. You understand? It's not because God enjoys doing this. God is responsible. He created it all. Revelation 21, 2, And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, this is where I want to be, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And then Revelation 21, 4 says, And God shall wipe away how many tears? All their tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. Hallelujah. I'm so tired of seeing people suffer. For the former things are what? They're gone. There's a new heaven's. And a new earth. Now, this is Nahum 1 9. I'm thankful for this. I said this one night, I think, a little bit. I'll say it again tonight. When Jesus gets done, when he saves us, transforms us, makes new creatures out of us, when he comes again, we get new bodies. Whether you're resurrected or you're living when Jesus comes, you're changed in a moment, the twinkling of an eye. When Jesus does all of that, we are still free people, we're still not robots. Remember, God wants children, not robots. We're still children. You have freedom of the will. And so when the wicked have all been destroyed, God will create a universe where everybody in it will be free and sinless. That's an enormous accomplishment. It's an amazing accomplishment. The universe will be free and sinless. And affliction, 
sin will never again arise in the universe. The former things are passed away. And that's why there's no burning forever and ever. Uh, the book of Revelation says, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. Well, what happens to smoke? It eventually disappears. It's a, it's a terrible time. The destruction of the wicked is a terrible time. And it has eternal effects, but it has an end to it. And we thank the Lord for that. All right, 2 Peter 3.13 says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. No lake of fire in that new heavens. No lake of fire in that new earth. It's all gone. And I want to say hallelujah tonight. And I want to invite all of us uh, to take this serious. I mean, it's a terrible thing to be lost. I, I know I said that the other night, but think of what it means for somebody to be lost. In this nation, we have a lot of respect for human life. If somebody were to get sick tonight, we have aid cars. We can make a call to 911, and they'd turn on their sirens, and they'd be here as quickly as they would. Why do they do that? Because we love life. Am I right? Life's important. Um, and so if it's important to us, how much more important is it to the Lord? And, and to lose, I mean, it's bad enough to lose somebody here, but to lose somebody for eternity, there's a finality to that. That's why Jesus went to the cross, is to keep any of us from being lost. I um, want to end with this thought tonight. The Bible says that God will wipe away all tears. Could you handle that? But let me ask a question. Who will wipe away God's tears when the wicked are destroyed? Who will wipe away his tears? I think God bears the sorrow of that somewhere in his heart for eternity. I would like to bring, because he's done so much for me, I would like to bring joy to God's heart. I would like for him not to have any tears in his heart over me because I want to be right there in the new Jerusalem where he can look at me and rejoice over me and say, you know what? Jesus and I, my only begotten son, it was worth going to the earth to redeem you. What a wonderful God we have. So as you think about this subject tonight, the word eternal is there, the forever and ever, but it has a context. And the context is that when it's all done and finished, the effects are forever lasting. But God doesn't want us, any of us, to have to suffer those effects. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, thank you tonight for your love. Even though this is a serious and a sober subject, even though it's made fun of and laughed at by many people in the world, truth is that you are a God of justice, but it's not something you look forward to. It's your strange act. It's something that you bear not because you want to, but because you have to in order to guarantee and to guard the civilization of life eternal. Thank you for sending your only begotten son so that none of us have to be in that lake of fire that every one of us, by the grace of Jesus, can escape. Our sins can be forgiven. We can become new creatures in Christ. We can live good lives, not because of our own power, but because of His mighty power and His mighty touch. So as we go home tonight, I pray you'll go send us home thoughtful and thankful for Jesus. And in the morning, may we come back and as we explore these great subjects again. We pray the presence of Jesus will be here in his wonderful name. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for being here, and we're going to have a marvelous time in the morning. Two great subjects, the unpardonable sin, what is it, and how does somebody commit it? And, um, and the first one, we're going to talk about Daniel chapter 1. If you want to read Daniel chapter